Welcome to the Product Design Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Coolen, founder of UX Cabin, where we create world-class web and mobile apps. I'm excited to bring you a behind-the-scenes look into the lives of some of the most interesting and talented people in product design. We'll get strategic advice on how they got to where they are today and things they wish they would have known earlier in their career. Hey, thanks for checking out the Product Design Podcast. Today, we have Travis Hansen on the podcast. He is a UX, UI designer, developer that works on the UX Cabin team. He's been here almost for two years. And Travis, it's great to have you here, man. Uh, Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and what you like to do? So I do design and a little bit of development, like, like Seth said, at UX Cabin. Been here for about two years. I live in Utah, which is a very fun place to live. I highly recommend it. I really like what I'm doing. I like the process of building stuff and just anything where you feel it like adds value to the world, I, I guess. And then outside of work, uh, I play a lot of pickleball. There's a lot of outdoorsy stuff to do around here. So I do uh, kind of all of that. And yeah, that's me. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit how you got started into product design and what eventually led you to get into the design field? So I went for undergrad, I did a business degree and wanted to like start my own thing. And then kind of shortly after working on that, I realized I didn't know anything about like life or business. So I wanted to learn while getting paid. I heard about the field of product management and looked around for like a venture back startup that I could join. And in retrospect, super lucked out that I could just like grab a job like that right out of college. So I did that for five years. That business kind of had a bumpy ride. So I learned a lot of kind of ups and downs of startups and, and building products. And then I was ready to move on and wanted to go back to, to doing my own thing just thinking about like long-term building a company, I figured I should learn how to code. So it took some time off, learn how to code. And then in the process of building another product, I had the design on it. And in that process, I realized that designing was super, super fun. It felt more tactical than product management did, but didn't feel as insanely up and down as I did while coding in terms of getting frustrated at things. It was like a little happier for me. And so I realized I like product design, And then long story short, met you on Twitter just from some random retweet of someone that I follow and got invited to jump on with UX Kevin. Yeah, that was a really opportune connection. I feel like everyone, when they're building a business or an agency, everyone's like, it's really key for your first like handful of hires to be like really, really good folks. And I don't know how the stars aligned, but between you and a number of other people that we've had on the podcast, I feel like without even knowing it kind of struck gold and like how bad things could have gone if the initial hires were like a really bad choice or a wrong choice. But I think one like cool lesson that people can take away from your story as we get into it is like you hadn't done design or UX professionally. Like you had done a handful of things on your own and you just kind of like approached it as like, hey, I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure that things go smoothly and are awesome. And I know how to figure things out, even though I might not have the experience. You kind of like assured me that it was going to be okay. And you had the skill set to like, figure things out. And to me, that was one of the biggest things that I look for in in people is not like, have you done this a hundred times? More so it's like, can you figure this out? Yes. And I, I remember when we were talking about me joining, you said something along the lines of, well, it seems like you're doing a lot of things. And generally people that are like doing a lot of things, more things tend to happen or, or something like that, which kind of made me laugh. And I was grateful. Uh, I mean, not to be too squishy feely on, on the podcast or whatever. But but yeah, like having having someone like take a little bit of a chance was really nice. I don't know how to like replicate that for someone if someone was trying to get into product design, but that is really, really nice to have someone take like a little bit of a chance on you. Yeah. So you've kind of been on both the management side and the design side. 
Do you want to talk a little bit about why you wanted to make the change from product management to design and like looking back some of the pros and cons of that switch? Yeah, for sure. I did product management for a long time. And I think it's kind of a sexy job these days. There's a lot of good things. It's well paid. You kind of feel important because you're like in charge of a product and kind of like in your little sphere, what you say goes in a lot of ways, uh, other than whatever leadership will steamroll that sometimes. There's a lot of good things about product. But one thing that I didn't realize going into it that would make a big difference is like, you also kind of don't do anything as a product manager. Like you, you just talk to people and, and like they go, they go do things. That's like fun in some sense. But I remember when I quit, it was like terrifying, but also really thrilling where I realized that like me making progress was 100% just on me. Like I couldn't go convince someone to make a thing happen. I just had to do it. I think there's a lot of like fulfillment that comes from actually doing tactile like work, even if it's just moving rectangles around a page as a designer. You feel like you've created something versus you just kind of influence someone else to, to create something. If someone is listening to this and is kind of like evaluating product management versus UX design, something that is so tricky with product management is you rise or you sink with the ship. With design and development, you can just show your work and like if it's good, it's it's good. But as a product manager, if the product didn't succeed, then like your work wasn't good. Like even if you did all these things <laughs> right. and there's a lot of factors like that outside of your control. I guess it's like a word of caution for people thinking about product versus other areas of building a product. So uh, during your five years yeah. of managing products, you're kind of on the other side where you're working with project managers and product owners who are trying to convince you like this is the next right thing to work on. And you probably have thoughts or opinions on that. Did you ever like butt heads with your designers and developers on the next thing to build being the right thing? You have to be organizationally multilingual. You know what I mean? Because like in one second, you're talking to the developer about really technical terms and like dealing with whatever stereotypical developer personality. And then in the other second, you're talking to a sales rep and dealing with like whatever stereotypical sales rep personality. In another second, you're dealing with an executive and dealing with their mode of thinking. I think being on the other side, so like working as a, as a designer and sometimes developer, now I realize that you, you actually rely a ton on the context that a product manager has. And I think I like deep down didn't realize that as much before or sometimes felt like a little bit insecure that I was saying i like I had so much say in the what of of what got built. And so I think I appreciate more now that as a product manager, you just you do have more context because you're doing different things than, than just building all day. And then I guess having been on the other side now, I realized just like I was getting BS sometimes, especially by like a developer, whatever thing they, they didn't want to do or, and maybe they weren't trying to be manipulative, but just because they said things that I had no idea what they were talking about, that like whatever they said went, I was kind of a trump card because it's just like, well, well, okay. Like I get, <laughs> I guess it has to be that way then. But I, I think it's more of like communicating the urgency or anything that feels like an extra piece of work that needs to be done, having to kind of influence and talk through that and negotiate what's going to fall off the roadmap because of it. Nice. So yeah, Travis is kind of a unicorn in that he does design development, obviously has his, his product management hat on in, in a lot of scenarios. So Travis is like kind of the definition of the Swiss army knife of people, which has come in super handy. I think a lot of times there's this debate over like how general do you want to be versus how niche do you want to be in your skill set? Do you have any strong opinions on someone who might be starting out, whether to like double down on one thing or kind of broaden your skill set across multiple disciplines? That's a good question. And one I still kind of ask myself for me and, and what I want to do, what I, like what I'm doing makes sense. I want to eventually start and run a, a company and just like a tool on like software project. And so the more that I can get good at being able to build things in general, it, it makes sense. So for if someone just going into a career in design, it's just a trade off either way, if you're like broad or, or deep in a certain area. I would say like whatever you are working on, become very technical at it. 
like if you're going to be a designer and, and, and that's your career and you want to focus in a certain area, become extremely technical at it. Even if it's like copywriting, like have a process and know the principles and the philosophy behind it and the many different ways that you can do it. Because I think that the more you can become technical in an area, you just output better stuff and it compounds over time. That's great. So you've been here for almost two years and you're kind of here in the earlier days, one of the one of the founding members, as I call it. As the company's grown over the last few years, what are some of your favorite things about working at UX Cabin? So one of the things is this is the most enjoyable group of people I've had to to work with so far in in my career. I'm not sure what the combination of things is, but there's not much like corporate silliness or or pretense between people, which is is really nice. There's just less like posturing and and, like trying to be cool and everyone's like pretty pretty real, (laughs) which is so, so nice. I think the other thing is I've had like a ton of autonomy and, and I like that. Basically, if things are going well, then we have a ton of autonomy to try out new things, to give suggestions to the client, to kind of take things our own way. I kind of thrive in that environment. That's definitely intentional. The last thing I want to do is have to be involved in every project. So if we can bring on people who can use their discretion to make good decisions or just like problem solve or good people skills with clients, like all the better, the less I have to be involved in everything. I would be really upset if I had to be a micromanager. I know some people seem to like that, but if I ever end up being a micromanager, I know I've started building something in the wrong way. So that's definitely intentional and hopefully that stays intact as we grow. But I think you're right. The two things that you said kind of lend themselves to each other, right? So like the good people lend themselves to autonomy and you can't really have one without the other and have a successful business. So I think that's really cool to hear you say. If someone's listening to this, thinking about like, ah, I really wanted to, I want to be where Travis is building products, doing design, doing UX, and say they're in a different field or maybe just starting out. What advice would you have for them to get them to where you are today? If you're going to go the self taught route, I think what brought forward both my skill set and my confidence in learning in the future is that I had something really specific that I was trying to build. And so I wasn't doing a bunch of memorization or storing up knowledge on a just in case basis. I was building up knowledge that was practical. And so everything I learned, I really learned for the long term. For someone starting out or trying to get into product design, I would try and Think of an app that you want to design and be pretty serious about it in terms of designing it or talk to your friends and family and volunteer to design an app for them or a website for them. I think that'll get you so much further ahead. And then the other thing that I'm I'm still trying to do a better job at, but that I've learned is like funny as it sounds is to get on Twitter immediately and be very active in the design space or whatever space you're trying to get into. Specifically in design, you can learn from product leaders in the area. You can showcase your stuff. I've heard someone describe Twitter as it's like Instagram, but for thoughts. And so like Instagram, you win if you're like attractive and interesting and having an interesting (laughs) life. And Twitter, you win if you have interesting thoughts. There's a little bit that's also like if you have very anger provoking thoughts that you also <laughs> win. But like the, the good side of Twitter is, is you win if you post valuable things and interesting thoughts and you can jump ahead in your career and learning by doing that. Yeah, I really like what you said um, about the building a product to learn the skills. Because one thing I did, even when I was in college, is like, I just thought like, if I just go on lynda.com and just absorb all of these courses on how to do all these abstract things and just know the Photoshop menu back and forth and know what every tool does and all the options, then I'll be a really good designer. But really that just kind of gave me a, a little tiny bit of knowledge about these abstract things that I wasn't gonna use on a, a daily basis. But it's like, if you're building an app that you really want, it's kind of like, 
don't know, I think of it more like Zelda, where you get to a challenge and then you have to use all of your brain power just to figure out that puzzle or that challenge. And all of your effort is like super, super pinpointed into like, how do I prototype a drop down? Or how do I make a component that like stretches out? And like you said, I think that's just much better to like solidify the learning and the product knowledge into your head versus just kind of like these abstract learning things. Yeah, for some reason, it like becomes yours when you put it towards a purpose, I think. Yeah. And then the other thing I was thinking about too is what's nice about doing it that way is for me, it really increased my confidence. If you can have the confidence that like, okay, give me enough time and I will figure it out and I'll make it look good. If you can kind of get to that point, it's kind of like a superpower because you know you can do anything and it's just a matter of time that you need to iterate on it. This is still playing out for me. I feel like I've gone through these cycles a couple times now and I feel quite confident in both coding and design. If there's something I want to build, I can figure out how to build it and I can make it I can make it great. Yep. It's just a matter of time. And slowly the the cycles just get faster. I think it's your confidence increases as you as you go, which is a bonus as well. Yeah. I think another thing that you've brought up, especially with our interns recently, in how to learn skills really fast and really well is to be able to copy and taking something being able to analyze it and effectively being able to rebuild it in your design tool of choice. Do you want to talk about your thought process behind that at all? Part of getting good at product design is putting in the work and being good at your tool of choice and being able to like recreate anything you see. So something I've been doing once a week for the last year is filling my own design canteen by going and I'll copy Coinbase or Airbnb or some of the just iOS kind of system stuff, take a screenshot, slap it in Figma, and then just copy it pixel for pixel. In doing so, you learn a lot about use of shadows, use of the border radius, the style, the pattern of the buttons that they use, the nav bar patterns. The weird thing is you almost don't even have to do anything with it. You just kind of do it and it's there. And then the next time you go to design something, often ideas will come up and you'd be like, oh, like I could use that interesting transparency pattern or some selection pattern. I think that's exactly right because part of product design is being able to execute on the visuals. And if you can replicate these billion dollar apps pixel for pixel, you're getting pretty far in the game of being able to create these patterns. And then it's just having the knowledge and the wisdom to know when to apply these patterns. I think a lot of people think that UX design or product design is like this thing that you have to be super, super creative and think of something that no one else has ever made in their life. But the reality is there is a finite number of drop downs or button interactions or inputs that you can design. So it's more about applying the appropriate pattern, which maybe you have like eight different choices across reasonable styles that you could apply to your design or your product. And just having those in your mind of like, okay, if we go with more of a rounded approach for this button, maybe that makes the app more friendly. Is that what we want to use? Is that who that's targeting? Or it's like, what type of feeling do you want the app to have? And then you're like, oh, well, I've designed these apps that make me feel a certain way. So you just kind of continually add these arrows to your holder that you can shoot out whenever you need. Yep. The the design, the design quiver. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. You also mentioned another really interesting thing about using Twitter. I love Twitter. I think I've been able to connect with a ton of really cool people on there that I would not have been able to otherwise. Do you have any strategies for how to use it, how to network effectively on Twitter? One thing you can do that's very easy on Twitter, it doesn't even take putting yourself out there, is You can get to the forefront of an industry pretty quickly in terms of seeing what's being talked about, what's being thought. All you do is you find people you respect, and then you go click in and look into who they follow, 
And then you follow those people too. You kind of traverse the people's networks that way. So I really like it for that without like moving to Silicon Valley or whatever, you can almost enter into those networks. The other thing that's awesome is you can talk to anyone. And if if your (laughs) comment or your thought is good enough, they'll respond. And and like you've made a connection. I've been getting into crypto lately. The founder of Solana, Anatoly Yakovenko. The Solana is ginormous. Its market cap is like 60 billion or something like that. Now this dude's a billionaire. He, he tweeted the other day, I commented on one of the things he responded. And it's just like you're having a conversation with this random person, as long as your thinking is good enough, you can play right. in that game. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a, a fun thing. I've also had a decent amount of success just simply DMing people, not 100% success rate, obviously, but doing this is better than not doing it in in, in a lot of situations where you're like, hey, thought you might think this is interesting or making a little introduction or an ask. And I don't know, for the longest time, I was like, oh, I would never message anyone on Twitter. Like, I don't know. That's weird. But it's really just an easy way to kind of access people that you probably wouldn't have access to otherwise. Yeah. You and I were talking about this earlier. I got the UX cabin job through Twitter. I got connected to Sahil Lavingia. Um, he's the creator of Gumroad and a really prominent investor. So I became like a scout for his venture capital firm just by kind of like following him and then interacting a little bit and messaging. And so now there's like a subgroup that we interact with him and send him deals and whatever. I've talked to some designers at Apple, just asking him questions about different things. There's a lot of bad things about Twitter. There's a lot of like angry weirdness that goes on, but it also like really flattens the playing field. You can do a lot with Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I think the important thing is if you're going to reach out to someone or DM them, probably don't go for the the hard sell right away, whatever you're looking for, if it's a job or an interview or a discount or whatever. But if there's like a little bit of value that you can provide or give them or just thank them for and just kind of get the conversation started that way and kind of go into it looking to make friends versus whatever your hard sell is, maybe you get the hard sell, but you haven't made a friend. But if you have a friend, in theory, can take that long term, you can be connected with them, they can see what you share, you can see what they share. And you can kind of have more of this reciprocal relationship rather than just a a rando who asked me for something. So that takes a little bit of thought. But if you can do that, you're ahead of 99% of everyone else on Twitter. I still haven't figured out Twitter completely. I feel like I'm starting to pick up steam a little bit. I just passed 200 followers, which that was exciting. As long as you are kind of playing by the rules, I think there's kind of the Twitter culture of being honest right. and being pithy and saying valuable things. Yeah, there's, there's cool. a lot of a lot of opportunity. Yeah. So thinking about all of the things that you've gone through over your career, looking back, if you could give your younger self advice, what would it be? When you're just starting out, it's so easy to see people that got like a slightly higher salary out of college or that are doing like something that's sexy at the time and to be worried about that. For me, I wanted to go right into starting a company and right into being successful because like, of course, I was the exception and I didn't need trading and and all that stuff. If I was going to give advice to my younger self, it would be learn how to build things. That kind of took a while for me to realize how much I enjoyed that and just that there's so many downstream benefits from that. So I would say whatever it is, just learn how to build stuff, like be a designer or be a coder or be whatever, but get used to... Uh, Even a no-code builder. Learning how to build things. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Like build stuff and release it and try and get someone to use it. And that whole iterative process will get you far. I would definitely say go be active on Twitter and putting yourself out there. And then kind of going going along with what I said earlier, being long-term oriented. Don't worry too much about what's going on right off the bat other than try and be increasing your skills, like your hard tactical skills a lot, and then increasing your connections. If I was going to do it again, I would place a higher value actually on name brand. If I had the opportunity, I might have sought a harder to work at like a name brand place, uh, like a name brand first job or to get into like a name brand grad school. Just because in terms of long term thinking, that's something that I think is is more valuable than I gave it credit for back in the day. So you're just talking uh, about like name recognition for like future opportunities. Like if someone saw that you went to this school or worked at this company, that might kind of vouch 
for your credentials in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To younger me, I was like, I don't like really want to go like work for someone. I just want to do my own thing like right now. If I was thinking with like long term goggles on, I would say like, okay, cool. I'm going to go work at name brand place for just a couple years. In the long run, that's so short. And that can give me a ton of optionality going forward rather than having to like pursue my passion this very instant, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really good. So you kind of have me intrigued about the younger Travis of how your initial endeavor to work for yourself and be your own boss right out of college and how all that went. Did you actually dive into like trying to create a business or a product? Yeah, it was actually my last year of college through one of the the business school courses. That was one of the assignments to try and create a business. Since then, there's a lot of things that have actually like turned into this. But the idea was like, uh, a really easy way to record and share family videos. So it's like a family history type product. We went through it and did a lot of the exercises of the class and had things squared up and had like a, a developer that was going to start for us and were potentially going to like partner with this organization and that. I think the other members of my team just like lost interest in it, even though I was like really committed. That was a learning point in and of itself. But I also just realized that I just didn't have any skills on my own that I could offer. All I could do is just like hustle my brains out to try and make things (laughs) happen. And I also didn't have any like money yet either. So that's when I kind of like switched. It was like a month before graduating. I had never gone to a career fair or anything like like at a single recruiting event the whole time because I was like, screw that. I'm going to have a business right out of college. And then like a month before I I switched gears and it turned out fine because I got a product management job. But I think I would have thought about that differently in in hindsight. Sure. It's hard to know what you don't know when you're starting out. It sounds weird, but there's almost no get rich quick shortcut for this stuff. It's like there's there's a really amazing opportunity to self-learn and not necessarily have to like invest a ton of time into going to school, paying a ton of money if you want to be a product designer. But at at some point along the way, you have to like be like, okay, I'm just going to do nothing but product design for six months and try to build something or try to learn it or do it nights and weekends or whatever. It's funny. I think even when I got my first job out of college, I was like, holy cow, I don't know anything. Like I just need to like work for like five years before I can do anything on my own. (laughs) I can't even imagine what level those guys are on who like drop out of college to go build a a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah, that's the dream. Those are the examples that you see and and you're like, well, freak, yeah, that's, that's me. And and here's the thing is, I think you could do that if like you had already learned how to design or already learned how to code, then like, awesome, go do it. Because if you can build something and you can convince someone to pay for it, then like, boom, you're like, you're in business. That's what business is. Uh, But if you don't have those skills either, and like the skill that should be there is like business skills or sales skills or something to make up for that. But if you don't have any of those skills, then you got to go get some type of ability. Right. um, that you can use. Yeah. Right. Totally. So thinking about kind of like our first jobs and working with folks, if someone's listening to this, maybe this is a future employee of UX cabin. What's something that you would want a future team member to be able to know about working with you, working with UX cabin that you would want to help them understand how to work best as a team together with us? I think there's a a pretty good culture of ownership right now. And hopefully that stays that way. I talked about that earlier that we get like a fair amount of autonomy, but there's also an expectation as well. So when we're working on a a task and we're working with a client, there is an expectation that you can hear what a client is saying. You can pick out something that you can work on and then you can go to town um, on that. So I think being prepared to kind of proactively take things on, own them, reduce the ambiguity around the project as much as you can. That's something I think that we value and that helps in team scenarios is when someone is kind of gung-ho to own something. I think uh, Andrea was on the podcast not too long ago. She's a really good example. She started as, as an intern. And even if she was kind of inexperienced in an area, we could just trust that if we gave her an assignment, that she'd just go to town on it. She'd smart questions and and we'd help her, of course, but she would do a lot of work on it and really try to like own the whole solution and not just 
yeah. you know, kind of give up if, if she got stuck or, or that type of thing. So I think, yeah. I think that's a big, a big thing with, with working with us. I think that's, yeah, that's huge. Like it, doing agency type work for a number of years now, it's like most people can get a task to 80% done and that's a lot of the way done, but the hardest bit is the last 20%. And just being able to like push through, figure out what questions need to be asked, design the iterations, do the hard work to like drag that thing to the last 20% is so hard and so rare. But if you can do that, you will fit in very well here. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's like asking the questions, reduce the ambiguity, designing the thing cleaning up the design so that they're ready to hand off to the client, actually handing it off to the client and getting their feedback and just doing all the stuff that surrounds it to, to drag it all the way to done. Yeah. That's right. Cool. I also think there's a, lot of work. A, uh, a concept of like being so explicitly clear that anyone who's coming to read your message would either know the context or know what you're talking about because you've made it so fantastically clear, not in like a condescending way, but just like kind of preemptively asking yourself, like, what if they, what if they ask this and kind of preemptively writing out any forthcoming question that you might anticipate from the client or from the stakeholder, I think is a really, a really good way to reduce work, reduce communication churn and expedite design processes. Yeah, you have to be or get good at communicating with the client. All all of those pieces are work because even when you deliver to the client and whatever, even the Slack message you send, you want want to be very, very clear. Just like little things like either either posting like a link to the task that you're working on or a link directly to the Figma board or referencing an old message, just like taking out all of the the mental churn for who you're sending it to so that they have everything they need right there to either make a decision or provide feedback. Because like one thing that's lots of teams struggle with is just like getting feedback in the right amount of time. Like you might send everything and do a great job on the design, but if you're not good at kind of setting things up for easy feedback, like that's just going to be sitting in the queue for for days and days and then it doesn't move forward, you know? And actually just like the the follow-up that's required, it kind of transfers to any job, I think. But yeah, like getting something all the way done and yes. being persistent enough to do that. Is, and it's something that doesn't require like design skills to do that. Right, totally. So you have built a few little products here and we've kind of been the, the beneficiaries of using some of those. You've built share calmly, which hides certain windows on your computer when you're screen sharing. Awesome product idea. You built a few plugins for Figma. What's your strategy as to like how to know what to build next or your process for like vetting ideas for building things? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's still getting refined, but I think it's it's basically just like if there's a problem that I have and I can see it's not like deeply beyond my skill set. So I'm like, right. it doesn't require like science. It's just it's, <laughs> like, it's somewhat straightforward. I just look for problems that, that I have. So like share calmly was from like a very unfortunate instant that I had of accidentally sharing my screen. And then one of the plugins that we made was something that I was trying to do just to be funny. I'm working on like a crypto project right now. And it's just, it's something that I want. It's, so it's a wallet for like the Solana ecosystem and it's just something that doesn't exist i'm like i really want that and so hopefully other people do too so that's the very very basic process is just like if i want it and i can build it yep is is pretty much it i think the important thing too is to just be playing with things and building things not just waiting till you feel like you have the billion dollar idea but just being like i kind of always want to be in this mode of building things whether that's for your company and you get your satisfaction from doing that like within your company or if you have the urge to kind of like spend extra time to do it on your own time too but not waiting for that one thing the best idea but just like toying around with these little ideas i'm a firm believer that in product design and even just business quantity leads to quality eventually 
Yeah. And the nice thing is too, in product design, coding, kind of just this whole like tech area is it doesn't, it's not very far away from what you do in your day job. And so it's actually kind of like they both help each other. So like you get better usually at what you do in your day job by having a side project, you learn new design patterns, like I've learned how to make Figma plugins. And so like, I'm starting to automate some of the design stuff that that we're doing. And it nicely reinforces each other, which I don't think that happens in every field. This is kind of a bonus in building building products. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Travis, thank you so much for coming on. This has been great to chat with you. And there's so much to learn from your example. So thank you for taking the time to share with us. Cool. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is fun. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today on the Product Design Podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure and go follow our guests. Let them know they did a great job and you learned a lot. Um, more to come in the following weeks as we bring on new guests. Please hit that subscribe button so that you will get these podcasts uh, and learn a ton about the product design community. Excited to see you next time. Thanks.